Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, normally I would have started my lecture with the words Welcome to the Egyptian Museum in Munich. But now our conference could not take place here. And when I started to prepare my lecture, I tried to include as many Munich objects as possible to give us all the chance just to go down the few steps into the permanent exhibition and take a look on them. Unfortunately, this is not possible now, but I decided to keep the lecture as it was planned for last year, hoping to meet you here in Munich sometimes in the near future. But let us go now to the sweet chariot. The Staatliches Museum Ägyptischer Kunst Munich has recently acquired a stele whose relief decoration presents several iconographic and stylistic features which may add new insights in the general subject of this colloquium. The round-topped rectangular limestone stele, nearly half a meter high, is decorated in carefully cut sunken relief. Under the winged sun disk, a single scene fills the complete surface without marginal strips. The lower part of the stela is left undecorated. Perhaps it should have got an inscription of two or three horizontal lines. The scene shows a king standing in a chariot directed to the right. The chariot is carried by two galloping horses. At the front of the king's short wig rises an Uraeus. In his right fist the king holds a horsewhip, a quiver is hanging behind his back, held by a strap over his left shoulder. By his left fist the king grasps a bow and keeps two reins, leading to the harness and snaffle of the horses shown in detail as well as the two panachés composed of double feathers and sun disk. The tails of the horses touch the front of the chariot's body. A case for the bow is hanging on the chariot, whose large wheel consists of four spokes. Stylistically, the relief is characterized by the strong movement of the scene from left to right, created by the galloping horses controlled by the strain of the reins. The royal face shows clearly juvenile features. These features remind immediately several statues of Tutmosis IV, which also show the same type of short rounded wig with a deep undercut over the forehead. This date is confirmed by the hieroglyphic inscription in front of the king's head. Men Cheperu Ra, Jehutimes, Kakau di Anch. The relief of the stele finds another direct relation to Tutmosis IV. On his chariot in the Cairo Museum, the king is shown on both sides of the box in a battle scene the first complete battle scene at all. In its monumental character, it is not a detail of a larger narrative, but an independent composition. In this type of royal self-manifestation, Tutmosis IV anticipates a standard motive of Ramesside battle reliefs, where the king standing on the chariot is shown in full action equipped with a scimitar or with bow and arrows. The increase of action is also expressed by the flying gallop of the horses. I will come back to these type of scenes later on. All the requisites of these scenes have their origin in the second intermediate period where chariot and horses appear for the first time in Egypt. The invasion of Egypt by the Hyksos plays an important role in this process of transfer of innovative technologies, which includes also the scimitar and the composite bow. The life-size head of a Hyksos in Munich, very similar to the one excavated by Manfred Bitak in Teledaba, may stand for these evolutions.
The use of horses and chariot is at first a royal prerogative. The biographical text of Ochmose, son of Abana in his tomb at El Kab, gives a clear proof of this fact. Ahmose is following by foot his king Kamose on the way to Awaris while his majesty went on his chariot, as he tells. But already under Amenhotep I, we have an example of horses and chariot in private procession. In the tomb of Renani, also at El Kab, we see the tomb owner inspecting his fields while a harness team of horse and chariot is parked at the border of the field. In private Theban tombs, horses can also be found in scenes of presentations, and both horses and chariots are brought by Syrians in the context of tributes. Indirect proofs for horses in private possessions are whips and gloves, as used by charioteers, found in tombs or represented on private stele. Also, wagon makers can be seen in tomb paintings of the New Kingdom. The famous Senenmut, here in his Sistrophorus statue in Munich, provides several important examples for the role of horses in the uppermost class of society. His tomb complex at der Rilbacheri includes the burial of a horse, where also a horse blanket, now in the Metropolitan Museum, has been discovered. Horses and chariots belonged to the most precious property and served as symbols of a high social status. Therefore, they were integral parts of the tomb equipment and can be seen among the grave goods transported to the tomb. The motive of the tomb owner hunting in a chariot, first attested under Amenhotep II, has its predecessors in pictures of the Middle Kingdom showing the hunter by foot with bow and arrow. Apparently, the hunting seen with horses and chariot in the private area corresponds to the royal battle scenes. Both are connected by the common aspect of the annihilation of the evil, may it be an animal or an enemy. In the early New Kingdom, royal battle scenes with horses are rather rare. Regine Schulz gives in her habilitation thesis Der Krieg als Bestandteil der göttlichen Ordnung a list of references. Relief fragments of Ahmose show the heads of horses in almost vertical position, which cannot correspond to the context of battle scenes. The earliest complete representation of the king standing in the chariot and shooting an enemy can be found on a scarab in the British Museum dating to Tutmosis I. There has been a discussion of its date, contemporary or posthumous, and I tend to an original of the time of Tutmosis I. On later scarabs and scaraboids, the horse stands as hieroglyph for king, thus assuming the role occupied by lion, bull, sphinx, and falcon, but it doesn't find a really important place in the royal iconography. The horse showed up too late on the scene. Back to the chronological evolution. From the time of Tutmosis II, isolated blocks exist which belong to a larger battle scene. The original context cannot be reconstructed, but it is evident that Egyptian chariotry played an essential role. In the 18th dynasty, the idealization of the king finds its culmination with Tutmosis III. I will come back to this point in a few minutes. According to textual evidence, he was one of the most eminent warlords. The booty of the Battle of Megiddo consisted of 2,041 horses, 191 foals, and 924 chariots, but reliefs of battle scenes are very rare, just two blocks in minor scale, today also in the Metropolitan Museum. Amenhotep II mentions and shows his training as an archer and picks himself of the markmanship of these arrows on the famous so-called stele. 
Schießsportstele, as it is called in German, showing him shooting on a bronze target. Battle scenes in relief are not attested for his reign. The stylistic development of the royal portrait tends more and more to a youthful expression of the face. Relief blocks from a portico of Amenhotep II, where probably also the last block belongs to, show the deployment of prisoners behind of the king's chariot and on the back of the horses. Additionally, the scene of smiting the enemies is included into this sequence, which has got already at this time a symbolic, ahistorical character. Representations of battles are not attested. The power of images replaces real actions. The battle scenes on the chariot of Tutmosis IV have already been mentioned. No earlier comparable scenes are known so far. The scene of the king supervising bound prisoners on the back of his horses, as shown on the block of Amenhotep II, just shown, is repeated on a stela of Amenhotep III, an isolated symbolic motive without historical impact. Real battle scenes are not attested. Let us have a look on the basic character of kingship in ancient Egypt. Pharaoh always had a double nature, a divine and a human one. Already in the Old Kingdom, this dualism found its expression in such a work of art as the double statue of King Nyusa Ra in Munich, differentiating clearly between the features of an elderly man, the human king, and a youthful, more idealizing face, the divine pharaoh. As a result of the experiences of the political crisis of the first intermediate period, the idea of kingship tends during the Middle Kingdom more and more to the human nature of the king. This vision is reflected by literary texts, of course, and finds its artistic expression in the highly individual portraits of the rulers of the late Middle Kingdom, showing the king as an old man. This vision of human kingship is still reflected at the very beginning of the New Kingdom in the portraits of Amenhotep I and can also be found in the early portraits of Hatshepsut. Typical features are the triangular outline of her face, its cat-like impression or the semicircular eyebrows. As a result, of the more and more idealizing tendency, the faces of Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh, and of Tutmosis III, the male one, in the reliefs of the Chapelle Rouge at Karnak are almost identical. They represent the king and thus overcome the problem of dynastic controversies. Also, the following generations underline the ageless expression of idealizing faces at the expense of personal features. As we have already seen during the following reigns, the royal portraits are becoming younger and younger, and at the same time, the reliefs stress the ideal of the sportive and gladiatorial hero. The adequate pictorial means is the king in the chariot. The historical function of the ruler finds its expression in textual sources. The climax of representations of horses in quantity and quality is reached in the Amarna period. Many waste paintings show horses galloping in full motion. A sculpture model excavated in Amarna, now in Berlin, may be labeled the best picture of a horse head in Egyptian art. The almost three-dimensional limestone relief confers the muzzle and the nostrils a very sensitive surface. The delicately cut eye underlines the extraordinary quality of this animal portrait. Branding irons and curbs as these examples in Munich and Berlin are additional proofs of the common keeping of horses in Amana. 
By the way, are you aware that the name Tutmosis of the sculpture who created the famous bust of Nefertiti has been discovered on the fragment of an ivory blinker excavated in his house at Amarna? Apparently he was the owner of at least one horse, a sign of his high social status. Large relief sequences depicting the narrative of a specific event are an invention of Amarna art. Several reliefs in the temples and private tombs of Amarna show the ride of the king in his chariot through the main street of his capital, from the palace to the temple, followed by the offerings in the temple and the way back to the palace. The king is accompanied by his family, Nefertiti standing next to him in the same chariot, the princesses in a separate one. The galloping horses and the chariots are essential elements of these manifestations of royal presence on earth. These relief sequences telling a comprehensive story are taken up after Amana by Tutankhamen in large-scale temple reliefs reporting on battles which probably never happened, are historic scenes going back to the warlike reliefs of the pre-Amana times. Of special relevance in this context is the painted box from Tutankhamen's tomb. The scenes of the two opposite sides equal the hunting of animals and the annihilation of enemies. The battle against Nubians is confronted to the lion hunt, the battle against Asiatics to the hunt of the desert. In an even more concentrated manner, the same ideas are expressed on the two shields of Tutankhamen. One shows the king as a winged sphinx, trampling two enemies. Pet pet chasud is the Egyptian expression for this action. On the other shield, the king smites a lion by his scimitar. Under both scenes, the base zone shows the hieroglyph Chasud for foreign countries. Ramesside temple reliefs are using the same dualism of hunt and battle as expressions of overthrowing the evil. On the back of one part of the pylon of the temple of Medinet Habu, Ramses III is smiting the enemies. On the rear of the other one, he is hunting the wild bull. The reliefs of Seti I on the outside walls of the Karnak temple show the final phase of a long narrative. After the battle, the king is mounting on the chariot and inspects the prisoners assembled in front and behind the chariot. A channel gives the scene its local surroundings, thus pretending historicity. When Seti presents the prisoners to Amun, he has left the chariot, approaching the god as an offering priest. Historical reality has become a religious ritual. The culminating point of the battle scenes, the so-called Schlachten Tableau, is the battle of Kadesh in its different versions, for instance here at Luxor. The narrative covers several days and different locations. No longer a relief is confined to a single event. Another monumental example is the relief of the naval battle of Ramses III against the Sea People on the northern outside wall of the temple of Medinet Habu. A combination of the linear narrative, like Seti I at Karnak, and a comprehensive tableau. The symbolic level is evident, combining elements of battle at land and sea, separated by the scene of the king hunting lions, which means annihilating the enemies, the evil, not a real hunt. This is a great innovative approach in contrast to the classical pattern copied by the 20th dynasty. To come back to the Munich Stile, most probably created in the time of King Tutmosis IV, 
it combines the two basic aspects of kingship. The ideal of the victorious ruler beyond historic reality, the hero on the chariot with horses as emblematic animals of the ruler like lion, bull, sphinx and falcon. And on the other hand, the human king, personalized by his youthful features and the inscription dominating the whole scene. The high quality of the relief and the masterly composition of the scene point to royal workshop. Would it be a private order, the name of the owner should be mentioned. Most likely, the stela was produced as a royal reward for a successful and loyal personality not yet nominated as such. Private statues of the new kingdom bear sometimes the formula die em hesud en ger nisud, given as a reward by the king. A similar formula, including the name of the future owner, could be imagined in the inscription at the bottom of the stele, which would have found its final place in the owner's tomb or in the forecourt of a temple. Thank you. <laughs>